This is Twit. Of all the ways tech is disrupting culture, the future of literature is one that I find the most interesting. Despite our penchant for TV and Twitter and tech gadget that tech gadgets that consume our attention, a lot of us are still reading. At least that's what our guest today hopes. Rob Reed, founder of Listen.com, has just inked a deal with publishing giant Random House and online publishing Upstart Medium to publish half of his newest science fiction novel, After On, leading up to the book's August 1st launch. Welcome to the show, Rob. Thank you so much. So tell us a little bit about this deal with Medium. I guess it's a deal with Random House and Medium. Yeah, but I kind of put it together and they were both you know, kind enough to go along with it. So basically... Um, back in the dim dark past, uh, publishers would traditionally, would very commonly release a big chunk of a new book in a major magazine. That was how a lot of books used to get launched. They called it first serial. And that kind of stopped about 15 years ago as ad dollars left magazines. There were fewer ad pages and magazines started to shrink. And so I've been thinking that it's a good time to try to bring this practice back online. And Medium is a fabulous place for long form written content. And I know some of the folks there. So I got to talking to them and I got to talking to my wonderful publishers at Random House. And the result is, we're publishing almost half of my new novel and it's a long novel. So that's a couple hundred pages that we're going to be publishing on Medium in 12 excerpts starting today. And um, that is, I think, one of the biggest, if not the biggest serialization deals in terms of sheer pages and word count and content that Random House has ever done. And they've been in the business for a long time. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I think about it, um, you know, what you talked about, like magazines where they would publish the first chapter or publish an excerpt. And I think about the in the 19th century, when, you know, Mark Twain would publish the entire book serialized. Like it would come out, people would wait with bated breath for the next chapter. This is somewhere in between. I hadn't heard of half of the book. Uh, so you say this was your idea? Yeah, well, it was my idea to put this deal together between Random House and Medium. Now, lots and lots of people have published books online for free. Lots of people have released chunks of their books. What's a little bit unusual is that it is a major publisher, Random House. Um, it is what they call a frontline title uh, of which there are you know, several hundred over the course of a year, but not tens of thousands. So it's coming out in hardcover. It's one of their priority books. And with a book like that, it's quite rare for a major publisher to release much more than the kind of normal segment you might see as a preview in the Kindle or on iBooks or something like that. So it is unusual that they're releasing a gigantic amount of this book. And it is kind of like that old 19th century deal. Dickens would release books like that, Mark Twain, and basically anybody who was writing books in those days. And exactly Exactly as you said, they would either sometimes they would appear in the mail, uh, sometimes they would be serialized in a newspaper or other or other periodical. By the time the late 20th century came along, magazines, as you were saying, would normally just put out one chunk of a book in a single issue. So this is kind of a balance in between, and it's the side, sort of thing that we can do on the internet today, and particularly medium is really well tuned toward it. I mean, it, it'd be interesting to do it on Twitter, um, but my book <laughs> is 547 pages long and at 140 characters a shot, it would start getting a little bit slow after a while. Yeah, let me just go ahead and thank you right up front for doing this on a platform like medium versus yes. a platform on Twitter, because I'm not sure that I could survive through a, an entire novel on Twitter, although it has been done. Mm -hmm. I, it I, has been done. There are, Pretty there much everything has been done at this point with novels and online media. <laughs> exactly, right? Right, because everybody's kind of trying to find how you bridge the gap between kind of the old, the old guard and the new guard of how this distribution happens. Was it easy to convince Random House? And I mean, this speaks volumes for for Medium as a platform. Was Random House on board immediately, or did it take a lot of convincing to do that? Yeah, so Random House views me as sort of their their pet entrepreneur. So many years ago, I started the online music service Rhapsody, the company called Listen.com. We built Rhapsody, and it's. A lot of entrepreneurs have gone on to write books. I don't know of any other entrepreneurs who've gone on to write really major works of fiction. I'm sure that there are others out there, but it's pretty rare. And so Random House kind of used me as their pet tech entrepreneur, which is true to a certain extent. And I'm known for constantly mistaking my books for startups. And so when I come <laughs> to them with some you know, kind of goofy proposal of like, hey, we're going to do this biz dev deal with this company in Silicon Valley, they usually play along. 
And um, I got to give Random House a lot of props. They're very digitally savvy for a giant company of really a, a company of any scale. They've been, you know, really smart about how they've used social media. They were super early getting their entire catalog up on the Kindle many, many years ago. So they're pretty digitally forward. It wasn't a, a, a very difficult pitch with them or with Medium. Um, it's a, you know, it's a pretty natural story, and particularly because this book is is a very you know, deep in the tech sphere. It's set in present day San Francisco. It's about the startup scene. Um, it's about a diabolical social media company that suddenly attains consciousness. A little bit of a spoiler there, but you'll see that coming like hundreds of pages off. So it's very much about the digital world. It's very much about the online environment. So I think there was a natural fit there as well. So if your books are like startups, do you buy them free lunch and like foosball tables and stuff? Yes, I treat my books very well. I don't want any of my books leaving me for another author. That would be a terrible thing to have happen. And I also give them fabulously generous stock options as well. Good. So it's a very, my books are very, very happy with me. Oh, good. Uh, so I know Medium is starting a subscription service. Like I've been uh, contacted and I haven't looked too much into it, but I, I have seen some authors are giving away, you know, a video free, but then their content is behind a paywall. Is your book behind the Medium paywall? Yeah, so they just launched their subscription service a couple months ago, and I think it's fair to say that they are in a, you know, uh, a, a period of intense experimentation with it. So what we're doing with this book, with my book, is the first three excerpts, including the one that went up today, are going to are just basically open posts. They're free to the open internet. They'll always be out there. They'll always be accessible. And the three of them combined come to about 50 pages of the novel. So it's a pretty big chunk. In fact, that's probably more than 90% of of books will make available in their you know free digital book preview or whatever. So that's a lot. The next nine excerpts are going to be members only at Medium. Um, I'm pretty sure they've got a generous um, free trial policy, but that's also something they're experimenting with. So I don't want to misspeak on that front. But the next nine will be behind the paywall. I do know that Medium membership is $5 a month. Um, then the other thing that I'm doing, which is pretty fun, um, is I'm creating eight really long in-depth podcasts that go into the science and technology that are connected to the book because the book goes deep into artificial intelligence. It goes deep into quantum computing, synthetic biology, consciousness, neuroscience, all this stuff. And when you research that stuff, as I did talking to lots of brilliant scientists and technologists, you find yourself wanting to put these 20 page digressions into your story about how cool synthetic biology is right now, but that's kind of lousy storytelling. So your, your editor gets really mad at you. So what I've decided to do is I'm making these really in-depth podcasts that are long form um, interviews with people who are expert in these different fields. And I'm also putting those up on Medium. Now, those are also in the members only section, but when the book comes out and it comes out on August 1st, all, I'm going to put all those audio casts up as podcasts on iTunes and Stitcher and everywhere else. So those will be going up week after week after week after the book comes out. Initially, members only on, on Medium, but starting in a few weeks, has, that's going to be a series of podcasts that are kind of like, I don't know, extra content to wrap around the book. So you're doing this podcast with our friend Tom Merritt. Um, I am. <laughs> and so who are some of the guests that you two are going to be talking to? So basically, Tom and I co-host each episode, and we talk about the topic that we're coming into at the beginning, then there's that long interview, and then we discuss the topic in the book afterwards. So uh, our first episode is about augmented reality, because the book starts with a, an augmented reality sort of scene in a famous bar in San Francisco called Bourbon and Branch. And uh, my first interview, our first interview is with Marone Gribbets, who's the CEO of Meta, which is one of the three leading AR companies right now, in my view. The other two are Microsoft and arguably a company called Magic Leap, although they've never shipped a product. They've raised over a billion dollars, so they're pretty prominent. So Marone's got products out there. He is really, really sharp on AR. That's our first guest. Uh, second guest, we're talking to Adam Ghazali, who is a brilliant neuroscientist at UC SF. Um, Adam is doing extraordinary research in the field of video games and how video games can quite literally reverse dementia. And that might sound 
kind of insane, but he's actually landed on the cover of Nature, which is one of the two most prestigious scientific journalists, journals in the world for that work. So he's our second guest. Uh, we talked to Sam Harris, very well-known author and commentator on issues of you know geopolitics about nihilistic terrorism, which is another major theme in the book. Uh, we talk about um, uh, digital privacy and government hacking uh, with Cindy Cohn, who's the head of the Electronic Found Frontier Foundation. That was a fantastic uh, interview that we just finished editing. I'm really excited about that one. Uh, we talked to Steve Jurvetson, who's a really prominent venture capitalist, about quantum computing. He's been on the board of directors of a company called D-Wave, which is the biggest quantum computing company in the world for 15 years, which is an incredibly long haul for a venture investor investment. As a former VC, I know that's an incredibly long haul. So lots and lots of people who are deep in these scientific and technological areas. Um, uh, Andy Hessel, who, is, who started the Human Genome Project 2 about synthetic biology bunch of folks nice that's a great and a great kind of supplement to the to the content inside the book which i have to imagine i mean from from what i read because i read through a, a piece i didn't get through the whole uh piece that you put up on medium a few hours ago but from what i read through and some of the excerpts that i've read of yours in other places around the internet today like the the point of view of this story i mean you've got a very particular point of view about what the future of silicon valley and all of this technology that we're so deeply entrenched in right now mm -hmm. potentially leads to do you do you have hope for where it's all going and is this book kind of your perspective on a potential outcome or is it total fiction, total fiction beyond that? I have cautious optimism. I think that there's two or three things that we should be really scared about right now. And if we are scared about them and we're properly scared about them for the next couple of decades, I think we'll make it through the century. But I think it requires a certain amount of foresight and paranoia right now. Um, this will sound a little pompous, and I don't mean it that way because I'm going to be citing what I think one of the greatest novels of all time is. But just using it not to compare myself to the author, but citing, citing it as a phenomenon. I think one reason why humanity escaped totalitarianism in the 20th century was because 1984 was so prescient. And it came along exactly the right moment at the end of World War II when totalitarianism Totalitarianism was on the rise throughout the world. George Orwell freaked a lot of people out about that risk. And a lot of other writers did as well. And we got through a really scary time as a result of that. And as a result of a lot of other things. There were a lot of things, obviously, that went on in the Cold War that could have gone a lot worse. I think we have a lot to worry about from the proliferation of synthetic biology, uh, from what terrorists can very credibly do with SynBio in less than a decade, and also from the risks of artificial superintelligence, the kinds of things that people like Elon Musk and Bill Gates um, and Stephen Hawking and lots of other brilliant people have been talking about. I think we need to worry about the interplay of those three issues, synthetic biology, terrorism, and artificial superintelligence. And this book is a pretty serious rumination on those things. It is also very playful uh, because I do right in a very playful sense. You do. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of, of silly stuff that goes on. There's a lot of stuff. I have a lot of fun making fun of certain Silicon Valley tropes. Um, I mean, the, the central character is this diabolical social media company that attains consciousness, but then rather than going all Terminator and trying to kill us, um, she basically takes on her character from that which she is, which is a social network, and kind of becomes a hyper-empowered, super-intelligent 14-year-old brat. So there's something that's playful about that. Um, but but it is also very, very serious, and it's a serious look at issues that I think are existential. And hopefully those two things together, plus a storyline that moves along pretty zippily, will keep people engaged and get you know some people thinking about these issues well before they become major problems. Now, do you worry as a, an author and uh, a tech person, do you worry about competing so much with Snapchat and Twitter and, you know, every other, you know, Netflix that we could binge constantly? Do you worry about having that, that kind of competition that arguably George Orwell did not have? Yeah, George wasn't really competing with as many things as writers are today. But, you know, I love the era that we live in. I created what's essentially the forerunner to Spotify. So my the music service I started, Rhapsody, we were the first folks uh, to get major record label, major deals, full catalog deals from all the major record labels. We created the streaming model that, that Spotify has since popularized so magnificently, and I love Spotify. Um, so I'm very much a part of the problem or the solution or whatever it is that today's media is, and I think it's incredibly <laughs> empowering 
uh, for creators and consumers alike. So I think it's a magnificent era that we live in. And I would rather people read my novel because it's the thing that they really want to connect with more than anything else with a diversity of choices than to grit their teeth and say, oh my God, it sucks that it's 1871. And the only thing I can do is read a long, a long novel. Um, you know, I would have had more of a command audience back then if I'd managed to have a publisher. But I think it's wonderful that people are really empowered to connect with whatever they want. And the people who decide to read an ambitious novel in this environment are people who really want to be reading it. And by the way, that's why I'm putting so much of this thing up on Medium. Um, in addition to the excerpt that I put up there, I, I wrote, you know, kind of a five minute read, a post about why I'm doing this. And I made a point that I'm very serious about, which is, you know, this novel, like all novels, costs money and it represents a time investment. And this particular novel is kind of a challenge. There's a lot of science and technology in it. It is not for everybody. I mean, no novels for everybody, but this novel is perhaps for fewer people than a lot of novels because it is challenging. And I, I'd rather reach the people that it's really going to resonate with. And that's why we're putting a ton of it up on Medium, really. Maybe that's not why Random House is. This is probably bad for business. But really, if this isn't the right book for somebody, I'd rather they do things that are right for them because, you know, it, it takes a lot of time to read a 547-page novel. And I think that one of the great things about this program and about digital media in general is we can find the thing that's right for us and commit our hours to that. Um, so yeah, fewer people are going to read it than might have read it way back in the day. But frankly, a novel about a sentient social network probably would have struggled in the 19th century. Would have been seen <laughs> as a little bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you are a purist and you need to just read an entire book in hardcover or your Kindle, you can read Rob's Year Zero now. You can get that on Amazon uh, or any place you get books. Um, but if you if you want to read the first ex excerpt, that's on Medium. Where's the best place for people to find uh, all the excerpt, excerpts? Yeah, probably the easiest thing to do is just to, to go to my page at Medium, uh, just search Rob R-E-I-D at Medium. It'll come right up. The, t the excerpt is there. And then also that contextualizing piece um, that basically put it in perspective, the one that's on the screen right now, write for 7,500 hours, then hit post. Uh, that talks about why I did this and, and what's going on with the excerpts. And then you click on that first excerpt, Dare. And then what Medium is doing is they've, they're doing a number of these serialized pieces. And Basically, a table of contents will grow. It's up in the, as you can see now on the screen in the upper left corner, um, it says part one dare. That will build out as more and more parts oh, are released oh, and it nice. eventually will go all the way to part 12. And so, you know, come on into Medium. Uh, you'll find it very quickly and easily. Um, I think they're going to be featuring it pretty heavily over the next couple of days. And or follow me and you'll you'll just have your medium feed will be filled with each excerpt as they come out. They're basically going to be on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule for the next four weeks. And five dollars a month is not a lot. I think it was Baratunde Thurston that I saw um, who had his content up there. So it's not. Yeah, if you pay the five dollar subscription, you're getting a lot more than just your book. But I um, but you, I am yeah, there's really a ton of stuff. And it's it's a really um, I've talked a little bit to Ev and some of the other folks there and I'm, I'm not obviously not going to steal their thunder and they're still thinking a lot of things through and they're going to announce the full program when they're ready to. But they have some unbelievably cool and ambitious ideas. Um, so I'm really, you know, I'm not just saying this because I'm on the site today. I'm really excited about what Medium is likely to become with the subscription program over the, the coming weeks and months. It's pretty it's pretty darn cool. Yeah. And writers ought to be paid. It's hard work, like you said. Lots of research and, and work goes into this. 7,500 7, hours. hours. Yeah. That's Got nothing it. to sneeze at. I don't know how you do that, to be honest. That's you really take impressive. three years. <laughs> uh, the other statistic I'll throw out there is this book takes place precisely nine seconds into the future. So um, <laughs> you were talking about, is it speculative? It takes nine takes place nine seconds from now. So it is incumbent upon the reader to read it very quickly, lest it enter the past. So nine right. seconds is enough time usually to, to get through 547 pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, as on all medium pieces, it says how long it takes. Yeah, exactly. So this one's 25 minutes, I think. So. Okay. This is 25 minutes. Uh, <laughs> Wednesdays, not. I can already preview, preview that for you. Wednesdays is a 20 minute read. And then on Friday going into the weekend, it's going to get a little bit longer. So we're trying to pace it to the rhythms of your circadian lifestyle. Nice. Awesome. Well, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, check out Rob's new novel, After On, uh, and all of his work on Medium. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs>